Dr. Pacetta. Okay, thanks. Uh, thanks, Mr. Clancy, and welcome everybody. Um, it was not too long ago, just last Tuesday, actually, when we had uh, our last parent informational session. And that was the same day that we uh, were starting to hear that uh, state education department was, was going to be issuing additional guidance. And for that reason, uh, we knew that um, our opening reopening plan would probably be taking some twists and turns uh, once that guidance document came out. So last Thursday, uh, state education department did issue that guidance. And um, last Friday, we issued our first, really our, our the first element, the, the first layer of our reopening plan. So tonight I'd like to reiterate, you know, some of those key points um, from our initial statements uh, made last Friday regarding reopening. But we also know that reopening plan is pretty big and comprehensive. There's a lot of things that are involved with it. And while we knew that there were certain key points that people were particularly interested in, like um, the question about masking, uh, for example, um, as much as it, uh, of the attention um, that was put on that, and justifiably so, we knew that was a big topic. But there were a lot of other things that we knew we were going to be working on probably over the course of several days or even weeks, and our plan would continue to evolve. And so I just wanna make that point right at the outset that while we did make some, some statements uh, last Friday, and I will reiterate some of those statements now, um, we will continue to work on our plans in the coming days. And I'll highlight some of those areas that still need some, some further clarification and work. Um, you're gonna notice that schools take different approaches. Uh, some counties, for example, are working very much uh, together and in conjunction with one another. Um, you notice today, earlier today, it sounds like Onondaga County was coming out with some, um, some recommendations um, and I haven't been able to fully uh, read up on it, but I, I've been hearing about it, that the, there was some news in, in Onondaga County regarding um, some of the, what they're wanting to uh, introduce is, is new um, criteria for um, staff members in schools. So um, we will uh, try to bring you up to speed with exactly where we are as we sit here on, um, on a mon late Monday afternoon. So the things that we know already, and again, I know this is, um, we've known this for a couple of days now, but universal masking um, will be the way that um, the district is, is uh, going at the beginning of the school year. That may change. Uh, there are a lot of things that um, really are unknown. We don't know how long this current wave and the pandemic is gonna be, is gonna be occurring. Um, I think there's been a lot of conversation about at some point, would there be um, some new guidance that might allow for the different layered or tiered uh, determination for, you know, can a region go um, move away from universal masking. But right now, the things that we know are that the uh, CDC and the American Association of Pediatrics, um, ped of pediatricians, uh, had recommended universal masking. State Education Department then issued that as a recommendation. And then beyond that, from a practical matter, is, is uh, stewards of, of the district um, resources. You know, when we have conversations with our school attorneys, with our insurance carriers, when you're getting all of those people all in agreement that masking is something that would make sense, given that there's that level of guidance from these widely recognized authorities on, on these subjects, we'd be hard pressed to not do that. So in my mind, at the end of the day, this became a pretty clear uh, decision that we would open school with universal masking in place. And that would be for people, whether they're vaccinated or not, again, following the guidance um, from all of those organizations I mentioned. So that goes for all indoor activities. It also goes for um, adults and kids, anybody uh, who is on the school buses. And that will become important in, in some of the other things that we talk about a little later on in, in our overview. 
uh, other things that we know are going to continue that um, the recommendation was that we still maintain three feet of distance in schools. Um, so we will continue to do that. The reason why masking is so important is because we know um, that as much as we can, for example, place our um, desks three feet or more apart, um, there are going to be situations where, um, you know, when you have hundreds of people uh, together in, in a place, not just in our school, but in any place out in society, you're going to have people uh, be getting closer at times. And so that's why, that's one of the reasons why those organizations like the CDC and American Pediatrics Association um, recommended that masks would be universal. Um, that's sort of the great safeguard in all of this. So we, we are gonna continue with our distancing practices. Other things that are important um, in the guidance is that um, the recommendation was that daily cleaning would still be continuing. I would say that um, Nick Campbell and, and his team have done an outstanding job of making sure that happens. Uh, tremendous, tremendous amount of additional time uh, throughout last year that was invested in cleaning. Um, daily cleaning will still uh, be occurring in our school. We also will be cleaning you know, the high touch areas uh, throughout the facilities multiple times during the day. Um, so while we know that some of the newer information suggests that it's not, um, you know, contact points are not a frequent uh, cause for transmission, we still know that the advice is that it still could be if, um, if uh, these daily cleaning practices aren't um, taken into account and adhered to. Um, so we will continue those practices. Another thing that is a little bit different than last year is that uh, distancing is not required uh, on the buses. And that's something that was specifically mentioned in the guidance documents. That is, um, again, distancing does not apply uh, and uh, while students are being transported. Uh, again, that's why it is so important that uh, the masking continues. Um, so I, I will say that gives us um, a significant amount of more flexibility in being able to work with families. Again, I would say our, our supervisor of uh, transportation, Cindy Clark, had done a really great job of trying to problem solve a lot of difficult scenarios last year because one student's change in busing could have triggered a huge, huge amount of, um, of, re uh, of, uh, of redistributing uh, bus routes because we were stuck at that threshold of not having more than 21 students at a time on a bus. And um, we are by no means uh, going to be um, maxing out capacity on buses, but having the flexibility um, to, to uh, have more students on the bus certainly will help us in working with our, our families and, and being able to work with you and make sure that kids have a good experience getting to and from school. Um, this is a real big point because a lot of questions people were asking centered around would remote instruction be an option uh, like it was last year. And the statements from state ed clearly uh, have indicated that, you know, the things have, have shifted, you know, pretty significantly from last year. Last year, it was a question posed to parents that, uh, you know, it was essentially a choice if they were going to be uh, opting for remote instruction or hybrid or in-person instruction. Um, people filled out, we distributed surveys, people filled out the surveys and we planned our, our classrooms and, and bus routes accordingly. Uh, this year, it is a clear expectation of the state that uh, we are able to return to in-person learning. So that is not being presented as an option um, as it was last year. Um, the exceptions to this would be really the only exception would be if there is a documented uh, medical condition. And by documented, what we're what we would be uh, asking for and requiring is is certainly um, a doctor's verification uh, on that 
um, on that particular situation. Um, and we would then, uh, you know, take a look at that, uh, what, the doc, that, what that doctor submits and uh, work in conjunction with our school uh, physician and uh, come to a determination of, of whether or not um, in, in the best interests of that student um, and that student's educational needs if there would be some type of, exem uh, um, of exemption. Um, but the plan at this point is that there's not going to be separate uh, lesson uh, plans occurring. Our teachers are uh, hard at work preparing for lessons, uh, planning for um, you know, having our students um, in them in the classroom this year. We feel good about the fact that we're having our students back because we have taken the precautions every step of the way um, that we have. It would be um, a tough thing for me to say if, if, um, if we were um, not following the guidance, but um, we are, and we feel like we're, we're in good position to, uh, to open school this year. So again, I know this is a subject that a lot of people have had questions uh, about, and we're wondering, um, what options would or wouldn't be available this year. Um, again, just for to, to be perfectly clear, uh, we will not be issuing a survey asking people to make a choice. Uh, the only, um, the only um, reason why we, uh, a remote option would be in, in consideration would be um, if, if a doctor's uh, notification was presented and was um, confirmed that there was a need by our school physician. So um, other, other, Mr. Clancy, Mr. Panuccio, did you want to add anything to that particular area? Uh, so I'm, I'm imagining some parents may be wondering, well, how do we notify the district or, or who do we notify? So I will um, share with everybody that we are putting together a survey that will be sent out to everyone in the next day or two um, that will <clears throat> consist of really two topics. One of them um, is about transportation and about uh, families' intentions for either transporting or um, using a school bus for their children this year so we can make sure our routes are, co are correct. And the other item is about remote instruction. So the survey will uh, will do our best to outline the uh, process that Mr. Bassetta just spoke to uh, with regard to um, parents needing to provide some medical documentation. Um, and then a little bit about the process that the, the district will have to use this year to make a determination about remote instruction for students. Um, because as Mr. Bassetta said, it, it is very different than it was last year. Last year, there really was no process other than uh, a parent just making that determination and then the, the child was remote. This year, it's, a, it's, a, it's more of a process. So the survey will indicate some of the things that parents will have to provide, um, but will give parents who are interested in that pathway and have that medical documentation an opportunity to, um, to share that they're going to pursue that pathway so that we can begin communication with those families. Um, because again, it will be a process. It'll be more than, than a one-step indication this year. So that'll come out in the next day or two. So just look for that survey and we're gonna have a pretty quick turnaround on that because from our end, we have decisions that we have to make based on that feedback. And we've also appreciated the quick feedback we've got historically um, in some of the surveys that we've put out in the last, particularly in the last year and a half, uh, we have had a large, a very large number of people responding. And we found that, that the overwhelming majority of those responses come in within the, literally the first few hours of the survey. So not that we're trying to limit your response time, but we, you know, historically it's, it's been a very quick response for those that have have responded and as Mr. Clancy said we also want to be able to get to work to um, to work with people so that um, you know if, if we need to come up with some answers to some different scenarios then we want to be able to do that 
for everybody's sake. Some other items that are in progress, I referenced the fact that we probably would, would be having multiple layers of our plan determination. Uh, we've talked about a lot of the things already that we've, that we've um, you know, decisions have been made. Some areas that are still um, really subject to what's happening, I think on a, on a more regional scale, one is testing. There's been a lot of comments recently in the media of, you know, um, you know, would, are, are schools in some parts of the state or some part of the country are they? Uh, they're testing on some type of regular basis. It is not a um, requirement uh, of of um, any plan at this point. However, um, we do have the capability of being able to. Uh, engage in some level of testing that's being worked on regionally um, through Madison County and through our uh, people, uh, officials at Madison United BOCES. So again, I just want to mention that, that it is something that we've been talking about uh, working on regionally and, um, and if and when we need to make some type of move uh, towards um, some type of, of testing schedule um, we're working to make sure that we would have the, the capacity uh, to do that. But as of now, there is nothing in, in, in terms of any type of requirement for testing. Uh, and certainly if and when that would get to that point, there would be a lot more information coming out to families. So rest assured, nobody's son or daughter is getting, is getting uh, tested without your knowledge. And certainly you'd be well aware long before that was anything like that was starting to uh, come into the uh, into the picture. The other thing that was has been talked about a lot is the quarantine process. Those of you and probably many people who are participating on the call tonight have been a part of the the, the quarantine process in, in one way or, or the other. And we think it's important that people have a good idea of what are the things that might cause someone to become quarantined because it has definitely changed over time. The parameters for what causes someone to be quarantined was very different, for example, by the end of last school year than it was, say, back in December. Um, it really has changed and taken some twists and turns. And the health department is continuously evaluating that process. So when people say to us, well, how is the school determining who they're quarantining? To be very clear, and the health department will verify this, this statement as well, we've worked in conjunction with the health department because um, at the peak of the pandemic, um, they simply didn't have the capacity to reach people in, a, in as timely a fashion as they would have liked. Uh, but ultimately, we don't quarantine people. The health department will ultimately sign off on that or legitimize if somebody is put in that situation. We work with them, oftentimes, schools over the last year have, have delivered um, or relayed the message to people that they um, would likely be in a quarantine situation just because we wanted to get information out quickly to people. So that's still gonna be the case that we're still gonna work closely with the health department. The health department ultimately is the agency that oversees this process. They determine the criteria that people will live under um, the, the, the quarantine process. Um, and this afternoon, uh, um, several, a few a couple of hours ago, new guidance was released, uh, again, just this afternoon regarding updates to the quarantine process. So we haven't, because of the timing of it, um, we haven't actually been able to fully uh, digest the changes that are in that document. Uh, we're going to do that. We're going to be speaking more with our nurses and our administrators to make sure we understand it. Uh, that's something that we want people to know and understand. So it's certainly not a secretive document. Um, we want to, to digest it. We want, and we will be getting that information out to people just so you know, um, you know what the, the latest um, criteria is for, for being placed in a quarantine process. There are a couple of things that are helpful. 
again, when you look back to when we were at the peak of the pandemic, some things are a little bit different. Um, and again, the health department's going to say it, it really depends on each particular case and they will evaluate it through any unique lens that might make sense. But um, to a great extent, it appears that you know all the information we've been receiving to this point and from cases that we're familiar with, it seems like there is a high likelihood that people will not be placed in quarantine if they're if they've been vaccinated. That seems to be a pattern. Again, that's not 100% uh, without exception. I'm, uh, and, and the health department will say there could be exceptions to that. But under most circumstances, it does appear that even if somebody who has uh, been exposed to somebody who's been uh, who's tested positive, the vaccinated person likely would not have to uh, quarantine. Um, that situation becomes very different if the exposed person is starting to exhibit symptoms, then typically they will, um, then a quarantine um, would likely come into play. But if it, without symptoms, um, vaccination is a, is to a, to a pretty large extent, um, is, is helpful in, in, in helping people to avoid being quarantined by the county. Um, another subject that we've talked about and uh, is, is sort of evolving quickly is athletics. Uh, you've probably heard if you've been listening to the, the news, um, for example, Onondaga County made some statements in the last couple of days, the county executive saying that they were largely following state education uh, advice, but they were not recommending that uh, the portion about um, athletics, because in the state education endorsed guidance document, uh, there was discussion about and language about um, not having high risk sports continue in high risk areas. And so there have been some discrepancies in different regions of the state and counties. And I think that's an ongoing conversation. I know our athletic director, Mr. Cangden, is going to be a part of um, um, at least one or, or maybe two meetings uh, related to that subject tomorrow. And so I would just say on that subject, because leagues and uh, you know cross counties and in different regions, there's a lot to sort out. And obviously, we'll share information with you as we get that information. Um, so that's a work in, in progress. We will, but we will be sharing more with you um, on athletics and in some other areas as, as information comes out. So like I said at the outset, um, our, we will be issuing our, our final plan. Um, that's some parts are already uh, finalized, other parts are still evolving and our complete plan will um, be coming together fairly quickly as these pieces are all tied together. Again, I'll ask Mr. Clancy or Mr. Panuccio, any members of our, our administrative uh, team, if there's anything that I neglected to mention or that you'd like to mention um, to clarify any of the subjects we've talked about. So I just wanna talk really quick about uh, if people have been around the school buildings this summer, you've seen a tremendous amount of work being done on them with our large capital project. Our contractors will be turning the buildings over back to us uh, by next Wednesday. So all of their equipment will be out of the building so our teachers and our staff can get back to a normal school. And I just want everyone to be reassured that any contractor working in our buildings are also required to wear a mask. And there will be no contact between any of the contractors and our students. So I just want everyone to be aware of that. Thank you. Any other comments from the leadership team? Okay, Mrs. Henner, uh, what questions do we have? So we had a, a few questions come in. Uh, most of the questions you answered during the presentation, the questions were just asked prior to speaking about those items. So just to kind of recap on those pieces, uh, one of the questions <clears throat> was pertaining to being able to transport students on busing this year, as opposed to 
you know, encouraging and asking parents to do the transport. So just to, you know, review that, that yes, due to the new guidelines and um, not being able, you know, that we don't have to uh, assign one student to a seat that yes, we should be able to transport all students this year um, and that a survey is coming out within the next couple of days to, um, to try to find out what the family's preference is going to be for that so that the transportation department can plan accordingly. Um, some other questions that have come in um, kind of pertain to just procedural pieces like drop off and pick up locations uh, and, and things of that nature. Um, just, you know, I've kind of responded to folks as they've come in that you know, those plans are still being worked on um, due to some of the incoming um, and changing guidance that we're receiving, but more to do with the ongoing construction and what areas of the school will have um, cleaned up and ready to go for that. Um, one question um, that came in a couple of times that really wasn't addressed tonight that I'm gonna bring up, I did not answer this question, <clears throat> is that if um, an outbreak you know, happens in our region, in our area, and it becomes necessary to close school again, you know, will virtual or remote instruction be an option for students, especially for the younger students who are unable to be vaccinated because it hasn't been passed yet? So I'll turn that over to our instructional team to answer. I, I think we knew that it was a fluid situation as it was last year where, you know, we, we thought at the end of the last year that we were maybe coming out of it and able to move more towards a normal situation. So we don't know what the future holds. We know that for now we're, you know, we're opening and, and that's the state's, you know, recommendation and that we are um, feeling like we're in a good position to execute that plan for in-person instruction. If the situation changes, which is, you know, always a possibility that, if there is something happening regionally, for example, um, we would work in conjunction with Madison County uh, or the state uh, health department to determine if it's necessary to uh, close the building. Um, we would always consult with them. Uh, if we got any indication that, um, that we were, you know, we were in, in, a, in a really tough spot and that we were, um, you know, contributing to a to an outbreak, we certainly would move to uh, uh, you know to shut down the, the schools. If that were to happen, and if for some reason the school was, was shut down, um, one thing we know is you know, we we would be able to transition uh, to some form of of continuing instruction. You know, so um, let's hope we don't get to that point. Let's hope that the model that we're currently working with, and that, you know, I think most districts are currently working with, let's hope that this holds. Let's hope that this latest wave um, subsides, um, and that we don't have to go down that road. But we need to we need to find a way um, to provide instruction. If we had to, then we would, uh, you know, we would have to what parameters were put in by. The, State Education Department as well, um, working in conjunction with the county uh, to facilitate that process. So let's hope it doesn't happen. But if it had to, we we, we have the capability, you know, because we we have done it before, um, to have to move to a fully remote. Uh, um, <clears throat> so some other things coming in along those same lines now as we're starting to talk about it um if if there is an outbreak um and it's not a substantial enough outbreak to close school like a school building down completely like we had done on various occasions last year and parents don't feel comfortable sending their children back to school based on um, the community spread rates and things of that nature um, is there a plan in place for students to receive virtual instruction? And as kind of a secondary note, something, uh, some other questions that have come in, um, if students are quarantined due to, uh, you know, being exposed to COVID-19 um, classmate or individual, is there a plan for remote instruction for quarantined students? 
So is there, the first part was, is there a plan in, in place if we were to have an outbreak or something less than being shut down by the state? Um, it's, as, as I think most, most people know, it's almost impossible to plan for every potential scenario because there's always different twists and turns, even from school to school or you know from one region to the next. So as of now, again, we're following the state's guidance that says that remote uh, or that in-person instruction is is what you know should, is what should be in place. Uh, we're also found the guidance in that we would use if there is a a medical condition or a medical exemption um, that that would be a reason why we would look at at some other model. We really would have to work in conjunction with the county and the state to say if something has changed. You know, we're only able to sort of plan for the environment we're currently in. We know that if th some things change or if there's if situations change, um, that door may may need to be um, opened, but it would certainly be in conjunction with working with all the different uh, parties who've been a part of this process from the beginning. So it's it's sort of impossible to, to know exactly how the future would, would play out um, with that. What we do know is that's our, that's that in-person is our model for instruction. Uh, as per the state's guidance currently. Second part of the question, could you say that second part again? Yes. <clears throat> if students are asked to required, excuse me, required to quarantine, will those students at home have access to remote and virtual instruction? Yeah, that's something that we're looking at and, and, and planning for. It's something that I think we'd want to be able to work with families on to see if we can facilitate that process. You know, if it makes sense, depending on the duration or what their circumstances are, or if students' health, or if they're just simply quarantined and not able to go, then um, that would be something we'd work with that individual family to see if we can make something work, um, you know, for that, for that type of situation. Also, a little bit along those lines, especially pertaining to students who are under 12 years of age in the schools for like Peterborough and Southside, are any extra or different precautions being taken or are there different protocols in place to keep the, the children that are not able to be vaccinated um, safer from contracting the virus? Sure, if, we're, if we have a question specifically about the younger grades, I don't know, do Ms. Carnahan or Ms. McClowry, or would you, uh, would you like to speak to your building? Mr. Basada, I can speak to Southside. Um, I just wanna start by saying that I think it's important to remember that we followed the guidelines faithfully last year. And as a result, we did not have any cases that were traced back to the building in terms of transmission. Um, and our school nurse can certainly speak to that a little bit more, but I feel confident in what we did last year and a lot of the things that we are likely going to replicate next year, emphasizing hand washing, um, making sure that we're mindful about shared materials, distancing, mask wearing, all of those pieces were really important last year. Um, and again, there was no transmissions or outbreaks related to being at Southside. So I think some of those those practices, which are just good practices in general, such as the hand washing, will continue and um, we'll continue to reevaluate all of those pieces as an administrative team when we continue to meet. Yeah, I don't, you said it very well, Mrs. McClowry. I think that's the frequent hand washing and all of the good habits that we were in last year. Um, it, that's exactly what things are gonna look like at Peterborough Street again this year too. Thank you. <clears throat> Looks like one last question that I see in the chat and then, oh, I'm sorry. Um, what, there is an additional one. Um, 
are children, are students going to be required to carry all of their materials, including Chromebooks, back and forth to school every day this year? I think that's going to depend on the grade level. Um, I can tell you for sure that we will be, well, it'll depend on the grade level and it'll depend on the situation. If, you know, there have been a lot of questions about what if, what if certain things happen? Well, in those circumstances, what I'm going to say in a minute may be a little bit different, but um, for grades K through three, I can say that those Chromebooks will be housed in classrooms um, at school so the students wouldn't be bringing those back and forth routinely. Will that change? I don't know, we'll have to see what, what happens. Um, four through 12, we wanted to continue to provide that opportunity to students. Um, I can say with some confidence that seven through 12 will definitely be bringing theirs back and forth every day. That's, that's a practice that's been in place for a while. Um, four through six started that uh, a year and a half ago and it uh, has proven to be pretty beneficial, not just because of the pandemic, but academically as well. So we're planning on continuing that practice. Um, I would say if there are specific concerns from a parent um, medically, if, if that isn't gonna be in the best interest medically for a, a child to reach out to uh, the building principal and we can uh, have that conversation. As far as that, and I'm just really speaking to Chromebooks, as far as the rest of their materials. Um, again, last year that was really precautionary because there were times where we weren't sure what the next day was gonna bring. Um, at this point, I think we have a little more ability to say that uh, things should be a little bit more routine and kids shouldn't have to bring things back and forth as much as they did last year. You said there was another question, Mrs. Center, or was that the last? Uh, <clears throat> that was the last question coming in through the chat. Um, I do know there's a participant in our in our meeting tonight by the name of Mark. He does have a hand raised, so I'm going to ask Mark to unmute himself if he'd like and to ask his question. Mark, if you're still wanting to ask that question, you can go ahead and unmute. Great, can you hear me? Yes, we Are can. Are you able to hear me? Yep, we can hear you. Hello? Yes, we can Hello? hear you. Are you there? Yep. Okay, sorry, I'm, I'm, in, the process, I'm in the process of driving. So no problem. this is more of a comment than it is a, than a question. Um, my, my question is, is the administration see the, the hypocrisy of socially distancing in the class, but not on a school bus, on a 35 foot box where there are more kids tightly packed than even in a schoolroom? Does that not raise any questions? Does that not raise any concern? Because I got to tell you, you speak of how you've referred this to the attorneys and gotten their opinion. If my child ends up getting COVID because of a school bus, I'm gonna be pretty upset and I'm gonna be contacting my lawyers. I think the school is opening themselves up for a potential hazard or financial, or, or I should say legal uh, 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 problem by doing such. I mean, I understand that you wanna get all the kids back in school, but the school bus is the worst place to do that. It's you can't socially distance three feet on a school bus. You just can't. So why would you open that can of worms and allow kids to ride back and forth for up to 45 minutes, maybe an hour for some of these students and be potentially exposed, especially the little ones who can't be vaccinated. It doesn't make any sense. And it seems completely hypocritical for this administration to allow that. Okay, well, a couple of, a couple of things with that one, we're comfortable with the position we're in because again, we're following the guidance that was established by, uh, by the state, uh, by the, I'm sorry, by the CDC, by the American uh, Pedi uh, Pediatrics Association. 
and by state ed. So as far as a legal position, we're following what the medical experts have, have advised and, and, and are meeting their standard. So uh, in terms of, uh, to my knowledge, that hasn't become a, a problem for districts who are, who are meeting those expectations. So um, we understand people have different ideas and opinions on the subject, but what we said all along is that we would follow the guidance and the advice and we're, and we're doing that. Um, so it's obviously a, a changeable fluid situation, has been for quite some time and the standards of change. And the fact is I'm not a doctor, you know, uh, most of the people on this call are not doctors or physicians or infectious disease experts. And so our best uh, course of action is to follow what they say is or is not something that they're comfortable with. And so I think- I don't, um, think, I don't think you have to be, going. I don't think you have to be a CDC uh, official or anybody else to use a little common sense and to know that, uh, you know, three feet, is not going to work and there's no way you're going to guarantee these young kids to keep their mask on you're just you're you're it's there's too much opportunity there for them not to follow the rules and i can't imagine that our bus drivers are going to be able to pay attention to the road and pay attention to the kids that close to ensure that that doesn't happen i just think it's it's a, it's a hypocritical statement to allow the kids to ride a bus and not social distance but then put them into a room and say okay you can now social distance and not have you know it just doesn't make any sense it's common sense i don't think you have to be a doctor or anybody else to see the, the writing on the wall in, in the issue with that oh again we're gonna we're gonna disagree i guess because we're we again we are following the the guidance of the experts and uh mr clancy what were you gonna Sorry. I was just going to, you know, we, we, we haven't and won't be making decisions based on our own opinions about things. We base our decisions on guidance that we receive from um, experts. So that's why we made that decision. And that's the guidance that we're going to be following. And we understand that some people, as they did last year, under any of these circumstances, they prefer to, to not use the, uh, the transportation, but we're providing transportation in a form that is <clears throat> legitimate by any of these organizations that have from the beginning of the pandemic weighed in on this and have been the source of uh, of, of guidance and i'll also say um i, I think if uh, you know having conversations with other districts we're certainly not interpreting this guidance in some kind of unique or overly um loose way uh districts are uh pretty much interpreting it the same way so i think if if you're if this isn't something unique to Canastota, I think most districts are also uh, working to meet the guidance, but also uh, are going to be using, um, you know, using the guidance that's issued uh, as, as we are. I think this would be a good opportunity for Canastota to stand above and beyond everyone else and stop following what others do. Let's well, we do don't, something different. We Let's don't, look for our kids. Yeah. My, my we haven't done that, and that would be, we haven't from the beginning, we've said we'll do what we can defend and what we feel is right. So we're not following what everybody else is doing. My point was, we're certainly not doing something that isn't common either. Uh, this isn't, if you, you know, if you look at what other schools are doing, uh, we're not doing something that's, that's wildly different. So, um, but again, it comes down to we'll do what we can justify doing. And, and that's where we, we, uh, we are. Mrs. Hunter, was there other questions? There are no other questions. Okay. Um, so again, we want to thank everybody for joining us tonight as we continue to um, work through some of the remaining uh, items on our reopening plan. Uh, we'll probably look to have additional sessions leading up to it, um, it just as we did last year around this time. So we would uh, encourage you, if you uh, still have questions, you can certainly reach out to your uh, the building principals. Uh, you can reach out to myself or Mr. Clancy, Mr. Panuccio, um, if there are things that um, that were not discussed. We understand everybody isn't going to agree. Uh, I think the shocker would be if we had complete agreement on, quite frankly, almost any issue. Uh, it's it's not the way things work, but we, we understand that. 
So, and we hope that people understand we're doing the best that we can. We spend uh, countless amount of time playing uh, devil's advocate to our own positions and looking at, at different pieces of information and, and evaluating information as it comes into us. And at the end of the day, you have to make certain decisions. And for the last year and a half, um, we have, uh, I think, been pretty consistent with the way that we've approached that. We're certainly not going to change our approach now because it's largely uh, been successful for us. Uh, it's been successful, too, because we uh, we appreciate the partnership with our families. Again, not that we always agree, uh, but I think our, our staff, our families have done a really good job of trying to make the best out of a tough situation. So uh, despite these challenges, uh, we look forward to finalizing the remaining elements of our plan uh, in the coming days. And uh, despite the challenges, we look forward to having uh, a good year. And hopefully, um, you know, hopefully we get through the, the uh, initial phases of the year and, and get off to a good start. And hopefully uh, some of these uh, challenges will start to subside. Mr. Clancy, Mr. Panuccio, anything before we? I'm all set. No, I'll also just say thanks to everybody for joining us tonight. Uh, we appreciate your participation and we'll continue to share information as we uh, put it together. All right. And if we again, if we have other uh, sessions, we'll make sure to get that information out. Uh, please make sure, as Mr. Uh, Clancy alluded to, that there is a survey coming out uh, regard, uh, regarding getting additional information on the transportation piece. Um, and also uh, just sort of clarifying that point on um, if there's a circumstance where someone was looking for any type of, you know, for some type of medical um, um, medical situation that needs further examination. Uh, so thank you and uh, thanks for joining us tonight and have a great night.